Good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to Van Andel Institute's public lecture series at the Crossroads Epigenetics and Chance in Health and Disease. I'm Kate Frillman, Philanthropy Director at Van Andel Institute, and I'm excited you are joining us to hear about the Institute's groundbreaking work in epigenetics. Virtually all 37.2 trillion cells in our body have the same DNA, but the human body has many different kinds of cells. That begs the question, how do some become skin cells or immune cells while others become muscle, heart, or brain cells? The answer is epigenetics, a complex set of processes that determine when and to what extent the genetic instructions in our DNA are carried out. These processes are vital for healthy cells and can play major roles in disease. Scientists in VAI's Department of Epigenetics are working hard to understand how epigenetic changes can protect us or predispose us to cancer, Parkinson's, and metabolic disorders. Today, we'll hear from Dr. Andrew Pospisilic, a leading expert who examines the role of chance and probability and how our genes are turned on or turned off through epigenetics. He joined VAI in 2018 to lead our epigenetics team. He is also a founding member of VAI's Metabolic and Nutritional Programming Group. Dr. Pospisilic earned his PhD in physiology from the University of British Columbia and focused his research on type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Prior to joining VAI, Dr. Pospisilic was a leading researcher at Max Planck Institute in Freiburg, Germany. He is the recipient of numerous scientific accolades, is a member of the World Economic Forum faculty, and he was recently awarded an NIH Director's Transformative Research Award. Our health is not influenced by any singular source. Our environment, diet, genetics, and epigenetics play key roles, and there's a fair bit of luck involved too. So I'm excited to hear from Dr. Pospisilic as he highlights chance in health and disease. At the end of the presentation, we'll have time for Q&A, and if you find yourself with questions during the presentation, you can submit them via the chat function or hold on to them and submit them when we begin the Q&A. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Andrew Pospisilic. Thanks very much, Kate. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity. And thanks to, <clears throat> to everyone who's signed on. Um, I have a few trainees now that think in words and, and not in images. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a very visual thinker, so it made me think to put into my presentation something that encapsulated what we're talking about uh, in, in a word sense. Um, and those of you who remember your your school poetry lessons. Um, you might remember The Road Not Taken by Robert Frost, <clears throat> which has this quote, two roads diverged in the yellow wood and I, I took the, the one less traveled by. Um, and that has made all the difference, right? And I think this really encapsulates the, the role of chance in health and disease um, and how decisions that the body makes or that are made for us by the environment um, can change our life, our, our health course lifelong. The visual representation of that um, is the famous epigenetic landscape from Conrad Waddington, who is this one is drawn in 1957 before we really understood what genes and DNA really were doing and how the blueprint of our body was was uh, coded. Um, and and that gets to the the question of that that Kate highlighted. How does how does one cell at the beginning of life become? all sorts of different blood cells, all sorts of you know stomach cells, muscle cells, brain cells, using the very same uh, DNA template. So what we're most interested in the lab, you know, the motivation comes from understanding how we're different, why we're different, um, and how that contributes to disease, right? And the dogma of the last 50 years, once we started understanding what DNA was and we started to be able to sequence it and we understood what genes were, you know, the answer was, well, everything is in our DNA. Everything's in the DNA sequence, right? And of course we know, well, if you, you go to McDonald's too much, it's also not going to be the healthiest thing. Um, so it's, it's our genes and our environment that define who we are across the, what we call the phenotypic landscape. 
all the different types of human outcomes that we can get. Um, and of course, I think the you know life around us shows that, that this paradigm is, is by and large very true. This is a, a, for, a portrait photography book by Martin Schuller, a, a famous portrait photographer um, out of New York. Uh, it's called Identical and it has, it has portraits of identical twins. And what always amazes me, so this, the front image is a, is a photo stitch of actually two twins, two identical twins that are so unbelievably identical. Um, and this is really the, this is really some of the, the, the basis of why we believe genetics are so important. That if you take the same genetic blueprint at one cell stage, you let it develop and you give it a fairly similar environment, you get an amazingly identical um, set of individuals at the end. Well, what the book also highlights, though, is something that we don't see on the street every day or we don't notice, is that there's identical twins that aren't so identical. So I always say, don't, don't be fooled by the haircuts here. Um, there's quite a bit of differences. There's quite a few differences between these two individuals. Um, you can see that the, the, the bone structure, the facial structure is quite a bit wider on the, on the individual on the right. Um, the, the type of skin on the lips and the shape of the lips are different. Almost every feature of these two boys, you can, you can identify differences in it. But they are, quote unquote, identical, uh, identical twins. They share almost identical DNA and probably grew up in, in very similar environments. And that's where we think epigenetics plays in. So if um, it's that what I highlight in the red curve down the, uh, on, the, on the left side, it's that variability that can happen to our DNA template or to our bodies um, that goes beyond genetics and environment that could change who we could have become in a sense. And that's this idea of, ch of chance. And why is it important? Well, studies show that, and this is really a ballpark figure, um, that about half of trait variation, so how the half of how different we are from one another really does lie in genes and the environment, sometimes more, sometimes less, but about 50% can depend on epigenetics or non-genetic, non-environmental um, underlying mechanisms, but those are very poorly understood. So why is this important? Um, well, I'm going to, so uh, sorry, one of my slides seems to have, I'm just going to switch one thing here. Okay, I have an unexpected slide, but I'll just keep on going. So traditionally, um, we, would, we, we, we lump individuals all together when we talk about diseases, right? When, we, when they say you have, um, when you have type 2 diabetes, all individuals out there is probably... I think it's a, right now the estimate is 400 million individuals with with uh, with diabetes in the world. We lump them into very big bins and we give them the same treatment. Some of those in, individuals respond very well, some not so well to the therapies, and some don't respond at all or even have quite adverse side effects. So the idea has come out um, of the biomedical community to pursue what's known as personalized medicine. And later that evolved into what's been called precision medicine. Um, originally, we sought after personalized it, the medicine with this, with this idea that if we sequenced every individual and we know everybody's genetics, then you know, we can develop a treatment specific to every single individual and make sure we have a, a positive therapeutic response in every single um, individual and it's optimized. The problem with that is that while it's I, while idealistic in, in the sense that we could diagnose better, we could prevent better, we could treat better, um, and we would understand every individual's exact disease, um, the real problem is that that's unrealistic from the point of, of costs. It costs, I think the ballpark figure is about half a billion dollars um, to develop a single medication that makes it to the market. Um, so of course we can't do that for every single individual out there on the planet. But what we can do is start grouping people that have very similar traits, whether it's their genetics, whether it's their environment or disease traits, whether they have they exhibit similar features in their in their specific disease. And basically, we try to pursue more and more refined disease subsets. So that's the concept of precision medicine. And right now, the bulk of work 
still focuses on genetics as the root of trying to identify um, disease subtypes for precision medicine, right? So, you know, could epigenetics play a role? So this is one example of, of how the field has come really far in the last decades. This is probably how, how any one of you in the audience understands diabetes. There's two major classes. There's some rare genetic types as well, but overall there's type one diabetes that, that typically children get. It's an autoimmune disorder and you get insulin therapy right from an early age. And there's type two diabetes. As you get older and a little bit heavier, you, you, you have the second form, right? But this precision medicine effort over the last years has actually um, brought us to five subtypes. And this isn't even well um, leveraged in the medical community, community yet. That's how, how new these findings are. The autoimmune, the autoimmune version on the left side, which was type one diabetes, still kind of stays the same, but that type two diabetes is broken up into four different types. And that's just by analyzing really lots of data into different clusters and seeing which people seem to be, who's, which people's disease seems to behave uh, most similarly. Um, and you can you can see now we've got four subtype major subtypes of type two diabetes. One that where you don't have enough insulin, to the second one where your insulin doesn't work well, uh, and the third and fourth where uh, they seem to be linked to just aging or or how heavy you are. And the point is now clinicians can go and start treating these these disorders selectively, um, and that's that. This is something that is happening in real time now. People are starting to get more precision treatments for their type two diabetes. Okay, so I'm going to tell you. I'm going to show you a little bit of data um, from a study that we just published um, that highlights that this might not well, that we might have to do more, and we may have to look at chance. <clears throat> what I'm showing you here is the the body size. So the fat mass on the vertical axis and the lean mass on the horizontal axis <clears throat> of many, many mice that are all genetically identical. Basically, they're all twins. And you can see the, the cluster and in gray, we have sort of the, the standard ones um, and in, they cluster very tightly together. This makes sense. Identical twins should be very similar. But on the right side, we found a gene regulatory network that if we just perturb it a little bit, suddenly we get two types of mice. You could think of it a little bit like the queen bee and the worker bee in a bee colony. They're very different. They actually have almost identical DNA, but their bodies, their behaviors, everything is different. So what we found here are what looked like two types of mice, even though they were all identical. <clears throat> and how it's determined which mouse becomes which seems to be really stochastic or dependent on chance. We, we cannot find a single factor that determines which way these animals go. Um, so that changes the, uh, from my original graph of, of, you know, how are we defined? Everything should be in our genetics or our epigenetics. The epigenetics in the red line now takes two peaks. It means that with the same genetic template, with the same environment, we can actually maybe get two different types of individuals. And this has big consequences, right? So how similar or different are those individuals? Why are the bigger mice bigger? Well, in this case, we traced it down to their beta cells. Those are cells in the pancreas that release insulin, which is the major hormone involved in, in diabetes, but it's also a really good growth factor. You can see in the, in the, in the uh, images on the bottom that the, uh, the, the beta cells on the, on the right side have many more glowing green dots that's a way we track how many cells are dividing, so how fast the cells are growing. And you can see that in the bigger mice, they have sort of super beta cells. They grow faster. They secrete overall in the whole body more insulin, and the mice become bigger. So we can figure these things out, and it's the same process that is making all the bigger mice bigger and the smaller mice smaller. If you thought about this in a human sense, uh, this would be, you know, this could be individuals that have the same genetics, they have the same environment, but we still have two precision medicine groups we need to tailor our treatments after and our diagnostics. So could this really play a role in humans? So that same study I talked about, um, we interrogated a really big resource in the UK called UK Twins that has collected, you know, millions of data points. 
on hundreds or thousands of twin pairs over the years so that we can try to remove the genetic factor from our analysis. And sure enough, while it's not one-to-one, -one, the analysis showed something very similar. We get individuals like the gray and green dots that <laughs> seem to have the same um, that seem to have the same patterns of molecular signatures as our smaller mice. And then we have those individuals in red that seem to have the same molecular signature as our bigger mice. And this is all somewhat controlled for genetics because we're doing it in twins. And for the same reason, somewhat controlled for environment, but that's not entirely ruled out in the human studies. So the model we're starting to build is a little bit like that breaking down type two diabetes into four subtypes. Now we think we've identified two subtypes of obesity. One that's both that are actually heavily dependent on genes and lifestyle, but where in the second flavor of obesity, or the role of chance and of a developmental process that changes the organism just that little bit, um, plays a, a, a much more substantial role than in, in what we call type A obesity. And the interesting thing is this could really apply then to anybody because everybody's got their own gen genetics and their own lifestyle, but this uh, element of chance can also apply to anyone out there. Uh, and so that's now one of the biggest questions we're pursuing is, are there subsets of individuals that are more sensitive to this process or not? Is it truly that everybody can, um, can, can be modified, let's say, by this, this chance mechanism? Okay, so this is the other way to think of it visually is, you know, you can think of yourself you, me, as two potential yous, right? So there could be Andrew one or Andrew two. And maybe if I, you know, if we could rebirth me a hundred times, maybe I would have come out in two different major clusters and we would have had to treat Andrew one in a different way than we would have had to treat Andrew two. And so if this is truly applicable to everyone out there, um, then the role of chance is, is major and we'll have to, we'll have to dedicate precision medicine, me medicine efforts, um, really gearing towards type A and type B um, individuals. Okay, so the, the, the main takeaways, if there are three, is that, well, who we become depends on genes, environments, as well as epigenetics. And I think that's underappreciated in the biomedical community. Um, the chance can have major impacts on health, health lifelong. It doesn't always have to, but it can have major impacts. Um, and that epigenetics in general is a future target for precision medicine. Okay, and the very last slide, I'm not going to go through this, but it's just to highlight that any one of us that publishes a scientific study, typically there's a whole village behind it, just like raising a child, you know, bringing an idea to fruition and testing and validating and finding all the resources necessary requires collaborators, trainees, funders, um, technological cores, operations of our institutes. And so there's a lot of people to thank and a lot of people involved in doing this. And on that note, I'll say thanks again. Wow, thank you, Dr. Pospisilic. There's so much to think about in those, in all those points that you shared. We we uh, appreciate your time so much. We have several questions that have come in. I'm going to ask um, kind of those uh, to start off with. The one is, what is the biggest unanswered question in epigenetics right now? Oh, I think I. I alluded to it a little bit near the end is we don't know who for whom epigenetics is a major driving feature of who they become and, and then what their disease profile is going to be and for whom it's not so important. So a little bit like thinking of the light mice and the heavy mice. Um, we don't know who's going to become light where it seems like epigenetics not doing anything and who's going to become heavy where it seems like epigenetics is having a really major defining role in who they become. And so for precision medicine, kind of, we don't know who's in which compartment. So it sounds like precision medicine is the way of the future and how we're going to be treated and how we're going to look at patients. And this is really foundational for that. Um, why is studying chance important? And what could those studies reveal about our health? Well, so I mentioned it in one of my first slides where I threw out this figure of about 50%. And so studies in twins, where we look at a lot of traits in twins, and we do that in, in twin pairs that 
have had the same environment and twin pairs that haven't had the same environment that were separated at birth or things like this, we can calculate the estimates of how much really should lie in the DNA in the genetic sequence, how much is environmental and how much is, is this unknown third something else, which we, we call epigenetics here. And, and those are the real numbers from twin studies is that uh, um, really a major fraction of metabolic and behavioral traits is in our DNA. It's about 50%. A surprisingly little amount is attributed to our environments. Um, and up to 50% for many metabolic traits in particular um, are, are due to some third unknown factor that, that we believe is this, this uh, stochastic, really stable programming effects. And what's the strangest thing the field has learned about epigenetics? Ooh, <laughs> um, I think the most unique one, uh, or the one that also stirs excitement, but is really... We, we have very limited knowledge of, of how it works, is some of these epigenetic effects seem to be transmitted through the generations. So we talk about intergenerational effects or transgenerational effects, where transgenerational effects are things that can pass through many generations, but they're not coded in the DNA. So there's something else carrying information about your characteristics from, from parents to offspring um, that isn't necessarily embedded in our genomes. Um, and that's an exciting area of research that we have very little insight into it. But once again, it seems to be that it can be playing this zero to 50% role. And it's uh, it's gonna be intriguing to know where and in which individuals this, this raises its head as a major driving factor of disease susceptibility, I always talk about, but equally important, disease protection. So something that impacted your great, great, great grandmother could still be impacting my own health today is kind of what you're saying a bit of. That, okay. That's right. We think there's molecular factors that can transmit. There's also, of course, many social factors that can be transmitted, um, mm -hmm. you know, behavioral phenotypes. We, uh, we often behave like our parents did or, you know, in the events of trauma, trauma can pass through multiple generations. Um, because the parents that have been traumatized will behave themselves and bring up the child differently. So there's both the molecular side that wow. we as epigeneticists are interested in, and then that behavior, behavioral side. Does your, does your work include that behavioral side, or do you work with other scientists in that space? Or? We don't. Um, so okay. the, the brain and behavior are so hard to study, um, right. and we all only have so much bandwidth that we've really focused on metabolism. Okay. And right. cancer. Of okay. <laughs> um, so what are you most excited to see in the future related to epigenetics? Um, well, I think what amazes me most about science is that um, – you know, scientists around the world, I don't know how many there are, let's say 10 million, 100 million scientists around the world. Um, somehow we we act organically like a giant brain um, with even though 99.999% of us never talk with one another, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so what always amazes me is how is how discoveries in on one side of the planet can, can cause massive change. Um, and off, sometimes those are technologies, and I look forward to those because every technological advance has, has uh, changed what we can do and which questions we can ask and which ones we can answer. Um, so I think, yeah, the the continuous role of technology and how that's changing what we can accomplish quickly in science. Yeah. Um, so several questions have come in to the chat. So when epigenetics and precision medicine make more breakthroughs in the future, what diseases or conditions would you like the field to focus on addressing first? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, all of them is the answer, right? Okay. I think, um, you know, we've got one of the one of the problems in science that's highlighted sometimes is that the big diseases that affect the most people, they get the most funding. So that would be Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, type two diabetes and obesity. But the rare diseases that only affect a few people, they're equally important, especially for those few people. Um, I think epigenetics is a fundamental process in every single one of us. So it will be applicable to all diseases. Um, 
fortunately, epigenetics excites enough researchers out there um, that I think progress is being made on all fronts. Yeah, that's great. Um, could you give some other examples of conditions or metabolic processes being studied by epigenetics? And this is a two-part question. Then they say, also, what factors influence what you decide to research? Okay, you might have to remind me of the second one. I'll sure. start with the first one. You know, what I've been talking about very much is this zoomed out view of the whole organism. At the same time, the original analogy I gave was of this one cell that was rolling down this landscape and how exact cells respond to metabolic inputs to change their DNA. So those molecular links that change that, you know, changes in the fuels that we take into the body and how the cells then can can alter their DNA stably. That's a that's a major area of research also being studied here at the Van Andel Institute that I think uh, has massive potential for understanding how we'll be able to modify these processes. Okay. What was the second question? Uh, the second part was what factors influence what you decide to research. Oh, you know, as scientists, we are also mentors for trainees that are going through their scientific development. Mm -hmm. So one major factor is, is the interest of the individual in question. Um, funding plays a major role uh, in that. So the major funder, funding bodies of, of the country are often listening to not only to what the public wants, but what the needs are out there and what the unmet questions are and the big gaps in knowledge. And so sometimes they'll really put, even though something's really hard to study or maybe really boring, they might put a bunch of money there and say, hey, if you if you want money to fund research, you have to answer this one unknown question that nobody seems to want to answer. And that's for the good of the public, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's definitely another major drive. And I think the third is, you know, inside each one of us is a curious child. Uh, and for me, I'm stuck on probability, chance, variability, and and distributions that can come out of the same DNA blueprint. So there we, you know, we follow the data where the data tells us certain genes are important. We start studying them. Mm -hmm. I sense quite a bit of passion there <laughs> in that last part. Um, what is the best aspect of joining VAI to continue your research? Oh, I think uh, a commitment at at all levels to sort of to, to world-class research. So we've got a world-class faculty, um, but I think what makes this really unique is a superstar lineup of, of operations or what might be called administration at other, at other people. There's this idea of servant gratitude here, of, of taking pride in helping the scientists do everything they need um, to make their research successful. There's a lot of administration and regulatory, I don't want to say barriers involved in research, but making sure we treat chemicals properly, we dispose of things properly, um, that, you know, if radiation needs to be used, that everything's handled safely. Uh, all of this takes a lot of work, the granting agencies and reporting. Um, so I, I think what makes us unique outside the world-class science and the graduate student training program we have is really a, a dedication from the top of the of the Institute to efficient functional science um, at its best. Yeah, I hear that many times from our researchers. So yeah, it, it's really phenomenal, the resources that we have. Um, how well are the epigenetic research studies indicative of the various populations? For example, many studies on men are applied to treating women, heart disease, or people of color. So this is something that's transformed a lot in the last, I'd say, ten or fifteen years. Um, it takes, you know, a lot of research. The, the one study I talked about took six to seven years. Um, so each of these little pieces of the puzzle that we do takes a long time. So I would say that fifteen years ago there was a very big concerted effort in the genetics community to begin looking at at non-Caucasian male. Right, and to look at the the global population, and we have lots to learn from every individual on the planet and their genetic variation. Um, so I think those processes are ongoing, and that's you know that's the perfect example when we talk about funding steering things. Now there's there's not big pots of money, but there's definitely funding available that is targeted only at looking at the more 
or the less studied genetic diversity. Um, and so I think the the entire community is is on board with, you know, scientists just want to learn. So uh, if that means that studying diverse populations is an opportunity for us to learn more, we jump on it, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. And this next question is, is related to that. They ask, how do you separate nurture environment from epigenetics? For someone who is from a marginalized population, there's often both historical generational trauma and present day mistreatment trauma. Yeah. Um, and so that's, you know, I, I said, do, you know, do we study behavior? We don't. It's it is a it's a tough question and it's very hard to study, especially in humans where it's most relevant, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So my lab focuses on analyzing very big data sets um, that are collected, for instance, by Twins UK. And we also focus on on model organisms like Drosophila. <laughs> you know, like fruit flies or like like mice, where all these things can be controlled. Um, there we really re rely on the epidemiologists to then link those signatures that we find in concrete definitive systems then to the human scenario, where it is a complexity beyond imagination that, that ultimately culminates um, in things like like the, the, the um, individual asking question is thinking right of of mm -hmm. intergenerational effect social effects genetic effects your diet as well um very tough problem to deconvolve but the key is we live in an age of technology where we can collect more and more data and the more data you have the more power you have to look for these kind of associations yeah thank you for for that because yeah there's a lot to that to that piece of um research. <clears throat> so you recently led a team of scientists that identified two distinct types of obesity. And can you tell us more about those findings? Um, they were just published yesterday in the journal Nature and Metabolism. So congratulations on that. Oh, thanks very much. Uh, yeah, that's some of the data that I showed you in this presentation it was the mice that I had the two populations in blue and the humans where there was this sort of green to red gradient, but still two populations. So we extended those findings and, and we looked for these very clear, I would say, epigenetic signatures. And we looked at them in much larger uh, populations, um, in adult populations, as well as in childhood cohorts, where we have a lot of phenotypic information. And what we found is it really looks like um, obesity breaks down into these two types. And that's important because there's almost a billion people that are overweight in the world, but we still just call it obesity. There isn't a type one or type two or, or different flavors. So we think we're making progress there. But more fundamentally, these signatures were also present in individuals that aren't very heavy. And this is where that element of these epigenetic processes, they apply to all of us, right? And they can make, you know, the the we all know our friend in high school that was very skinny could eat as much as they wanted always stayed lean they could still be a little bit heavier or a little bit lighter for epigenetic reasons um and so when we did that kind of analysis what we found is there's actually what looked like four metabolic classes of humans so two of those were really enriched in these two types of obesity but the other two were let's call them more, more average individuals on the BMI scale, um, but they still have these strong distinctions. And so understanding and knowing what these four metabolic classes of people are susceptible to or not, which, which drugs they respond to or not, uh, which diets are good for them or not, you know, those are the major questions that, mm -hmm. that are now gonna pull us forward. Yeah, fascinating, fascinating. We had a couple of questions related to data, so um, they ask, is there room for use of big data to support your research or colleagues in this area? And how readily are these epigenetic data sets available to the general public and informaticians, please? Any suggested links? <laughs> um, I'd say email me for the suggested links. Uh Okay. Uh, and I would work with I would work with you to I'm the only Paul Basilic at the Van Andel Institute, so it'll be easy to find me. Um, in general, they are very accessible. They are, of course, the big data sets that have private personal genetic information in them are, of course, controlled in the sense that you have to make requests for them. But overall, these are public. Most of the data is collected through public funding. 
So the goals are to make the most effective use out of it. Um, so from that perspective, it is relatively easy to access them. For some data sets, there's going to be a fee. For others, they're available uh, on repositories that you can you can download them within an instant. It all it typically depends on how processed the data is with respect to how identifiable an individual that was being studied could be. And so the less identifiable the individuals are, the more accessible the data. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, as it gets to privacy and, and, and those kinds of issues. Um, we are all set with our questions at this point. So I just want to say thank you again to everyone for joining us. And thank you, Dr. Pospisilic, for your presentation and, and fascinating insights. And I'd like to thank everyone for taking time out of your schedules to join us. And I invite you to stay engaged with the great work at the Van Andel Institute. Uh, please visit our website at vai.org where you can learn more and sign up for our mailing list and follow us on social media to stay up to date. And whether virtually or in person, we hope to see you again at a future event. Our next public lecture uh, is on December 6th and we'll be featuring Dr. Evan Warden, who will give us an inside look at cancer's molecular roots and what it means for health. You can find more information on our website and we'll announce soon more details about the 2023 public lecture, so stay tuned. And I just wanna say thank you again for your presentation. Thank you everyone for attending. And we hope you have a wonderful rest of your afternoon. Thanks very much.